Hello, this is the third and final video for uh, the video games uh, unit. Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation is the product. Uh, this final video is actually just a recap on uh, the stuff we've looked at in videos 1 and 2 and applying the theoretical framework. Uh, so the learning objectives for this video are going to be fairly obvious, but what we're going to do is apply aspects of the theoretical framework relating to audience, which was one of the videos, and then discuss industry theories that consider regulation and ownership, covering the other video. So we'll start with audience, and in particular, audience effects, which was uh, something we looked at regarding the theorist Albert Bandura. So. We know that this is uh, a theory uh, that was introduced specifically for this media product. Um, we had a look at it in one of the videos in a little bit more detail, but this will be really just a recap. So we know that Bandura's ideas are this uh, almost whiz-bang direct almost uh, effect on uh, audiences whereby uh, the media product can have a direct impact on the uh, audience, almost as if it was an implant. Uh, the second part of his theory is that audiences can actually acquire their attitudes, their emotional responses, and new styles of conduct or behavior through modeling that they see in the media products that they consume. And then finally, that media representations of transgressive behavior, for example, violence, physical aggression, can lead audience members to imitate those forms of behavior. So of course, we're going to talk about this in relation to um, the Assassin's Creed game. So what we'll do first of all is have a quick look at some of the more violent uh, aspects of the game. Okay, what a delightful uh, video that was. Um, whoever put that together obviously had fun uh, finding some of the most gory bits. Um, I particularly enjoyed the sound effects. Um, so let's apply all this to Bandura. So clearly there is a lot of violence in the game, uh, despite the fact that uh, you would obviously want your character to avoid being attacked or killed. Violence is obviously key to the protagonist. And it would be fair to say, I think that uh, it's somewhat glamorized or certainly could be described as I guess gratuitous violence. Now this is where we start to think about Bandura. Violence on this level could of course spark fears that the violence could be imitated. Now this would perhaps be more keenly felt in the UK where knife crime has become a zeitgeist uh, certainly within the media uh, these ideas actually are fueled by the print media if we look at a number of different headlines that have proliferated in newspapers and online news agencies over the past few years video games are seen as dangerous and so this is where we can start to apply Bandura's uh, theory that video games have this direct impact on the minds of the players. Now, of course, 
One of the reasons Bandura is introduced on the course is because he's a uh, theorist that can be argued against, and we can look at some of the reasons for perhaps not taking uh, his ideas at face value. First of all, the big one, it treats the audience as passive. Uh, it ignores other influences in people's lives uh, that also have an impact on behaviour because uh, video games aren't the only things to have an impact on someone. Um, it also completely ignores the context of the gaming experience or what we might call the situated culture. Gamers are unlikely to confuse the game with reality. They're playing probably in a domestic setting, uh, possibly in a bedroom, probably surrounded by the trappings of their normal life. So why they would suddenly think that they were an assassin would be maybe a bit of a stretch. That's not to say that Bandura's ideas should be completely ignored um, or not taken in as a part of a wider argument. Uh, there are arguments to suggest that younger players may be more susceptible to the effects of media, um, particularly as the brain is developing. Bandura, after all, was a psychologist. And of course, young peoples have a moral compass that is less fully formed than adults. So that idea of knowing the differences between right and wrong is somewhat... Um, uh, less evolved uh, in younger people, although of course we know that some older people uh, also do not have a particularly um, good moral compass. So there are some arguments for and against that can be applied to specific aspects of this game and you'd need to have some specific examples as well. Moving on to audience and a new theory for the course, fandom. And this theory uh, is uh, less to do with what the media does to us, an effects theory, and more to do with what we do with the media. And in particular, this is the work of a man called Henry Jenkins. Here's Henry Jenkins, and here are his ideas. Uh, he believes that actually fans are active participants in the construction and circulation of textual meanings. He goes on to say that the idea uh, has the idea that fans will actually appropriate texts and read them in ways that are not actually or fully authorised by the media producers. This is known as textual poaching. And then finally, the idea that fans construct their social and their own cultural identities through borrowing and inflecting mass culture e images. And they're actually part of a participatory culture that has a vital social dimension. So some quite complex stuff there that's uh, maybe fairly even fairly heavy and we'll kind of take these ideas one at a time and hopefully apply them to Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation. So let's look at this first idea, the idea that fans are active participants in constructing and circulating textual meanings. The question I have is how can audiences be active participants in the construction and the circulation of textual meaning? How can the fans, the audiences, actually add meaning or create meaning for a text that's already been written and produced and designed by somebody else? The answer, or one of the answers, for video games uh, specifically is that video games are fairly unique in as much as the game's narrative is largely controlled by the player. So, in other words, uh, whilst a game may be written, designed, animated, published, the player still has some work to do here. They can construct their own narrative, they can choose how to play it. There is potentially an infinite amount of different ways that players could play a video game. Although some actually may see interactivity as a bit of an illusion of choice, that the video game will always direct you and steer you towards the narrative that has been written. Um, additionally, though, uh, in favour of Jenkins' point here, the online community is actually much more vocal now in how it understands games through reviews and video walkthroughs on YouTube. So if somebody is playing a walkthrough uh, of the game, is, is recording that, puts it online, does their take on the game, their interpretation of how the game should be played, does that become more prevalent, does that become more powerful than the intended reading. We all know that there are preferred, negotiated and oppositional readings. Can there be instances with video games if someone posts their own walkthrough online that the negotiated reading can become more prevalent than the preferred reading? So this is what you need to do. 
and take some notes on, watch some of the walkthroughs of Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation uh, on YouTube. Find examples of the different readings of the game or even different interpretations of how the game should be played and what the overall aims are. Moving on to Jenkins' second point is this notion of textual poaching. The idea that actually fans can appropriate texts and read them in ways that are not fully authorised by media producers, which obviously links to our last point about walkthroughs and how uh, the games can be interpreted or seen or read in different ways. My question for this one is a little bit different though. Other than walkthroughs and online um, reviews of games, what different platforms are actually available for audiences to appropriate or poach texts that aren't theirs originally? Now, to do this question you need to think a little bit outside of the box and to find other ways and do a little bit of research into how audiences are actually using texts in ways that they weren't designed for originally. So, as I mentioned, the aforementioned walkthroughs on YouTube allow a certain amount of hijacking, of poaching if you like. However, one example of this textual poaching that Jenkins talks about are forums where gamers and other audiences will create their own fan fiction. This is where the characters, the settings, the plots, the storylines, the worlds of video games are used for audiences to write their own short stories, some of which are almost kind of novella length. Um, this is uh, a subculture, if you like. It's quite a fascinating uh, use of media text. It is becoming uh, more and more uh, prolific online and actually far from being something that's a, an incredible niche uh, corner of the internet. And so what you should do to get an idea of this is read some of the fan fiction. Uh, find some of these forums online. Uh, think about ways in which the characters and ideas from the games have been hijacked on social media platforms. And also think of other ways in which characters can hijack the characters or the narrative itself uh, to uh, use the game um, for themselves. So Jenkins' final point. This is the idea that fans construct their social and their own cultural identities through borrowing and inflecting mass culture images. That actually the audience has become more and more active and become a participatory culture that has this vital social dimension. The process of uh, communication is really is two-way. So first of all, give an explanation of what you understand this to mean. What do we mean by audiences borrowing uh, their own uh, fr from a game or from a media product to inform or influence their own cultural identities. Can you think of any uh, examples of how audiences might do this and can you relate it to any other aspects of the theoretical framework? I'm going to give you just one example but you will find others of uh, this. The aesthetic of this game in particular, uh, Assassin's Creed and the games within the franchise, has actually led to fashion outlets designing clothes that are similar uh, to those. Um, now I'm not talking about cosplay, which might fit in a little more with the second point that Henry Jenkins mentioned of textual poaching. This is much more about making your own identity formed by something like the media text. And it's not suggesting that perhaps this is the only media product that someone will use to shape their identity, but certainly wearing a jacket or a hoodie or uh, something that's functional clothing uh, that uh, might be in the style of or influenced by the Assassin's Creed game says something about you as a person. It might identify you as a specific type of gamer. It might be just that you associate with gamers in general. Um, similarly, characters might actually adopt pseudonyms and traits on a variety of social media platforms. You might decide to inhabit the life of a character on a social media platform. Um, you know, this is what social media is open to. And again, you know, 
uh, similar to that idea of cosplay where uh, you are inhabiting a, a, another person to a certain extent. Of course, I'm sure most of you got this, but the theorist to compare this to is David Gauntlet and his work on identity. So as a final task here, find examples of where the game can be used to shape people's identities. What you're looking for is examples where the game becomes more than just a game, but an influence on people's day-to-day -day life. Can you find evidence, for example, of this going any further than just perhaps um, borrowing um, the look or the style of these, uh, of these games? Moving on to cultural industries, we're moving on to the industry side of things here, and we know Cultural Industries is a theory by David Hesmergulch. So again, uh, we'll consider his um, work in a summarised form, and then we'll apply some of the ideas to it. Just to run through his ideas, they're um, quite simplified in, in, this, in this sort of pricey of his work. He suggests that cultural industries and companies try to minimise risk and maximise audiences. They do this through the way that they're organised um, in, in an industry point of view, from a corporate point of view, they can do this through both vertical and horizontal integration, and of course by formatting their cultural products. In other words, the things that they do with the media product or the text uh, can guarantee or should be able to guarantee a broader audience. He also says that the largest companies or the big conglomerates now actually in an attempt to widen their audience, maximise their profits, operate across a number of different cultural industries, or what we would probably call convergence. And he goes on to talk about these ideas of convergence. He suggests that the internet itself has a radical potential for maximising audiences, for uh, reaching new pockets of the audience, the niche audiences that haven't quite been reached yet. However, he says that this convergence and this use of the internet has only been partially incorporated. Uh, it hasn't been fully exploited. And he puts this down to the fact that, uh, that many companies and corporations are more profit orientated um, than looking at the potential creativity of the internet. So before we apply all these ideas, let's just quickly remind ourselves of some of the stuff we looked at in the industry lesson, some of the contexts uh, behind the Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation game. So from a production and economic context point of view, it was part of a successful franchise developed by the games company Ubisoft, re released in October 2012 alongside the Assassin's Creed 3 game. Now the reason it was released alongside uh, uh, another game in the franchise was because Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation was originally exclusive to the PS Vita, which was new at that time. It was later re-released in a modified uh, high definition version across a range bro broader range of consoles and systems, not just the handheld Vita. The game could be purchased over the internet via outlets such as Steam, PlayStation Network, or the Xbox Live Arcade. Now, from a social and cultural context, the game also had various talking points. The introduction of the PS Vita was an attempt to tap into a market of handheld gaming devices, which, of course, in 2012 was entirely energised by the growing popularities of games being played on mobile phones. The Vita had many similar functions, and you can look back at those in the previous lesson. And Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation had more diverse representations of women than many of its competitors within the, within the industry and even of previous games in the Assassin's Creed franchise. So with all of this information and the information you had before, what would David Hesmergulch say about this? Look at the summary of his arguments, apply your own knowledge of the game. So a couple of answers or a few points that you might have made in your response to this may include that being part of a successful franchise would obviously guarantee existing audiences. Simultaneous release with the Assassin's Creed 3 main game obviously ensures a greater exposure for both the new game Liberation and the console PS Vita which was new at the time. Then of course re-releasing it on more platforms 
uh, is a contingency. If the game didn't do well on the Vita or the Vita flopped, then of course there was still a chance to use and exploit uh, all the work that had gone into the, the game, the uh, Liberation game. Of course, from a cultural point of view, introducing a female protagonist or more interesting or greater diversity in representations, as we know, may encourage broader audiences than usual. There are other things that you might have included, um, uh, but they'll be taken on individual merit. The next aspect of industry is, of course, regulation. And in some ways, this does relate to some of the points we made at the very beginning regarding the uh, work of uh, Albert Bandura. Uh, but we look at regulation from the perspective of uh, two theorists, Sonia Livingston and Peter Lunt. And uh, again, we'll be looking at some of the uh, possible ways in which we can apply the uh, Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation game. Let's just break it down, though, into its constituent parts. Uh, Livingston and Lunt basically argue that there is an underlying struggle within recent UK regulation policy between two different sort of conflicting ideas. First one is the need to further the interests of citizens. Okay, As citizens, the suggestion is that we deserve to be protected from harmful or offensive material, in particular young people. Of course, the other side of the coin there when it comes to regulation is that we also very believe very strongly in a freedom of expression and freedom of speech and also um, uh, we live in a sort of free market capitalist um, society so there is the need that consumers have to ensure that they have choice to ensure that they have value for money to ensure that there is competition within various markets so those two aspects protecting people from harmful material is opposed to the idea that there should be greater and greater choice in society. The second aspect of Livingston and Lunt on the specification is that, of course, with an increasing power of global media corporations and the rise of convergent media and technologies such as the internet and transformers, uh, transformations in the way that uh, production happens, the way that distribution happens, the marketing of digital media, really all of these factors has placed traditional approaches to media regulation at real risk. It's a far more complicated issue than simply slapping a label on something, giving it a certificate, banning things. Okay, So that's what their points are, is that m regulating industries that are part of convergence that have online entities is a really tricky uh, business. So a little bit of background information. Again, this is all covered on the previous video, so you should have some notes on this already. Um, the representations of violence are a clear aspect of the decisions given uh, to give Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation that 18 Peggy rating. However, does this really address some of Livingston and Lunt's points? Peggy system is used by the regulators in the UK. These are the Video Standards Council, Okay, and Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation received the PEGI rating of 18. The PEGI rating is the one given um, and used by the Video Standards Council. So, you need to find out the following things. Based on the Video Standards Council mission statement and the PEGI criteria, what reasons might there have been for giving this game an 18 certificate? Have a look closely at the criteria and justify it. Second question, how can this rating be compared to the regulator in America, the, which is the ESRB? And, the, and can you research the UK's previous regulator, which was the BBFC? Have things changed under the Video, uh, the video Standards Council's uh, watch? So some of those answers will have been quite factual. They'll have been pairing up uh, criteria with the game itself. Um, but let's think a bit more closely at how we can um, apply and just discuss some of the ideas um, that Livingston and Lunt introduce. So first of all, does the regulation of this game actually represent that conflict between protecting audiences from harmful material and creative freedom of expression? Is there evidence of that conflict? And if it does, how would you say it does? And the second question, if we want to 
uh, apply Livingston Lunt and show the examiners that we properly understand it, what arguments can you make that because of convergent nature of games like this, which is fairly undoubted um, with uh, AC3 liberation, the, the amount of convergence used um, in different forms of media, um, how can we show that the regulation of games is becoming increasingly difficult? So in reality there, the four main theories that you need to be able to apply to uh, this particular media product, it's our only video game product, but I just thought I'd throw up some ideas as to where you can go next or just to make sure that you are completely and fully informed about this media product. Of course there are a number of different relevant issues to explore and research uh, that are attached to this particular product. The issues covered in these lessons are very much a jumping off point for a much deeper discussion. Uh, the video games industry moves incredibly fast, as do the opinions from both inside and outside the industry. In fact, it is an industry continually debated by experts and non-experts alike. So I'm just going to leave with you some final thoughts, some final questions that you might want to explore uh, and research and your own time to make notes on so that you know that you've got a really decent set of notes based on this uh, media product. First of all, what merchandising is available for the game? How can that be related to both parts of the theoretical framework involving both industry and audience? Does it tap into Hesma Gulch's ideas of uh, maximising profits, minimising risk? How can we talk about merchandising for a game in relation to Henry Jenkins' fandom? Moving back to perhaps Bandura and regulation a little bit more, how has this debate on video games and the impact they have on individuals actually moved on? Are the same old arguments being made as were 30 years ago? Or has any new research debunked old research? Can we find any maybe psychology research that perhaps usurps uh, Bandura or even backs him up. And then finally, again, this has been discussed in the previous videos, but please make sure that you've got plenty of notes on this. It is a key uh, topic that the examiners like to explore. How are new technologies changing the gaming industry and the relationship that there is between the player and the game? And if you have all of those things, if you've got plenty of notes on all of those aspects, then you'll have a great understanding of the Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation product.